Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borsch. This is Games You Should Know by Heart. And today, I'm going to talk about what I've learned from Paul Karras and Michal Botvinnik. Karras Paul was one of the greatest players, an eternal second, as they said. The Estonian never had the chance to become a world champion. He challenged Alakine, but unfortunately, World War II broke out, so it never really materialized. Michal Botvinnik is obviously known as a world champion, a very methodical player. But both were fans of something that's not very popular these days, and that is the isolated pawn structure. With the isolated pawn, they love playing on the side of the isolated pawn. Now, in today's world, it's like Apple for average people. People like Apple, but they like apple pie better. So they don't really go into the tarish anymore because it's just too much trouble and you have to play very aggressively. So first and foremost, I'll show you the game between Bobekov and Keras. Keras is famous for his creative style, his unusual style, which actually notched him a lot of points. So let's start. Knight f3, knight f6, c4, c5, d4, c takes, knight takes, e6, knight c3, bishop e2, d5. Now, you might argue, as a viewer, that this is not the Tarosh. Well, let me show you a different move order. So d4, d5, c4, e6, e3, knight f6, knight f3, c5, c takes, e takes, bishop e2, knight c6. We are here already. So there are many multiple ways of getting this isolated pawn structure, which will happen after, say, castles, bishop, d bishop d6, bishop d6, d takes c5, and bishop takes. And what, in general, the pawn can get very weak in the long term. So if you have an isolated pawn, you have to play very aggressively and with a principled attitude. So coming back to the game, knight f3 was played, d4 takes, knight c6, d5 takes, knight c3, bishop d6. There's usually two major ways of playing these positions, either putting the bishop on c5, but usually we post the bishop on d3 or d6, as it's a reverse position, so it's on d6 right now. Knight takes c6, b takes c6, castle, castle. In general, white gets a little bit better, but black will get attacking chances. b3, and how should black try and continue build an attack in this type of position? You already know that black will have to play energetically to show that he has good play for this weak d5 and c6 structure. So black must go for the king. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the suggestion is queen c7, rook e8. They play that way, but Karras decided to be even more energetic and build a different kind of battery on the h2ba diagonal, which is he played queen e7. So unlike queen c7, which is also an idea, he's trying to bring the queen to e5 directly threatening mate. Now, for example, if white would be totally clueless and play bishop f3 with the idea of bringing the knight to e2, Keras most likely would have jumped on this occasion, played queen e5, and double attack on h2 and c3. And after g3, he would thank his luck and win the piece. Obviously, Bobekov knew what's going to happen, so he played bishop b2. How should we continue here? Obviously, with queen e5, once we've planned an idea, we must go through with it and just do it. Queen e5, 
And there's only one way to stop the mate with g3. Because f4 would drop the e3 pawn, so that's not a possible solution. Now, the black queen on e5 is very active, but might run into some tactical ideas. Let's say like knight b5s. So black decides to move it to an active square. Where would you put the queen on e5? Yes. G5. G5. Why queen G5? It's a dark square. It can't be attacked. Yes. And it's also attacking the pin against white's king. Yes. So you could proceed on yes. with the h pawn, the knight, and also bring the rook into the game. It also has a bishop on C8 that can yes. go in there. Yeah. Bishop H3, rook D8, and now he played queen G5. So the idea was, as well pointed out, that we're kind of staring down at white's king, also planning this h5, h4 idea. Now that's actually very annoying, because if black manages to push the pawn to h4, it's going to be near mate. f4, no wonder that Boge Bobekov is trying, so Bobekov is actually trying to chase away the queen. Queen g6. And not h6, because he still has this h5, h4 in his back of his mind. Queen g6, bishop d3, queen h6. Why not bishop f5? Why didn't Karas play this move? He has a philosophical reason for not playing it. And the reason is that he wants to keep as many pieces as possible. Because if he runs out of pieces, he'll be saddened by this pawn structure forever. So queen h6, knight a4, bishop b4. Already kind of bothering that rook on e1. Bishop c3, exchanging that. And surprisingly in this Tarash kind of pawn structures, getting rid of the black squared bishop is OK. And this, for some reason, even advised. Obviously not when we actually have mating threats on h2 or, or on the king side. But when those threats are gone, exchanging the black squared bishop is a must or even just a very good idea just in general. Rook d6, knight c5, rook e8. Very good classical move by black. Bishop f1, knight g4. What, what is black planning after knight g4? What is Paul Karras envisioning. <laughs> okay, so black is kind of hinting on taking and just threatening all over the place, either taking on e3 or on h2. Also, if white would take on h3, queen takes h3, suddenly we see how good rook d6 was. Paul Karras envisioned this rook to move to h6 already putting a lot of pressure on the h2 pawn. Let's see, let's say rook c2 and rook h6. And black is again threatening knight takes h2. It's also good to mention that queen d2 runs into this splendid idea of d4. And if e takes, then black has a beautiful tactical solution here. black to move and win. Yes? Queen takes h2. Mm -hmm. And if queen takes h2? Um, one That's not quite mate yet. Okay, not quite mate yet, but yeah. King g2 and then check. And we'll take everything. And we'll be a whole rook up. So this positions, even though look innocuous, at first sight, can get awfully dangerous if white misplays it. So knight g4 takes rook e2, rook h6. He didn't fall for the queen d2, d4 trick. Rook e2, rook h6. Now, white had a threat in this position. What was white threatening? Actually, 
he had a very nice Petrosian kind of defending move in this position that White was aiming for. What was that? If White would be on move, what would White play? Yes. Yes, it's, it looks very awkward, but, okay, let, let me play an, a pretty suspicious move by black. But if we play queen f1, and it's a very good defensive move because this queen on h3 was very, very strong. So after it moves away, white might even consider bringing the queen to f3 or g2, and he would have a decent position. Now... Karras wants none of this and plays rook h6, actually suspecting his opponent of trying to bring the queen to f1. But that doesn't work now because we'll take and take the h2 pawn. So queen d2, and now he plays rook g6. And actually, this is a sign of a world-class player. He senses your plan, stops your plan, and after you chose a totally different plan, he switches back to his original plan. Now, after rook g6, he hints on a plan that we was planning to do five, six moves ago, but I think it's a great idea again. What is it? Yes? Um, what's wrong with rook c2? What's wrong with rook c2? Mm -hmm. Rook c2, it would hang the e3 pawn. So it's not a great idea at the moment. Queen d2, rook g6. So what is black trying to reheat as an idea? What is he trying to do again after so many moves? Yes. So H5, H4 plan again? Yes, H5, H4 plan again. Must have been annoying to be white. Always threatened by H5, H4. E4, H5 is coming. E5, knight H6. Hello, I'm coming. <laughs> Rook G2, queen C8. And actually, it's not an accident that black drops the queen back to C8. Because h4 would run into a cute little trick. It's white to move and when. Yes. G4. G4. And this time the rook on c3 would play peekaboo with the queen on h3, and that would be the end of it. So Karras, the eternal second, so pretty good player himself, decides to keep that queen for later. b4, h4, continuing with his plan. Knight b3, h takes, h takes, queen h3. You know, the stranger comes back time to time, and, but he's a known visitor on h3. Knight d4, knight g4. And in fact, I think Karras deserves a lot of credit for his creative play. The way he plays is quite unusual and innovative. You don't see many of these games in these d5 isolated pawn structures. So I think it's kind of a treat seeing him play the um, Tarish defense. Rook takes c6, takes knight c6, and now again Karras comes up with a splendid idea. A splendid maneuver that will actually win him this game. Even if we think logically, our queen is superbly placed on h3. The knight is just a beauty on g4. So, so we only need one more guy to actually win the game. Yes. The rook, but how should we maneuver with it? Yes. Rook e6. Up we go. 
Rook takes d5, rook h6. Queen d8 check, king h7, and actually that's why chess is beautiful. If you play strategically and you position your pieces well, they'll reward you greatly. White is completely lost because his pieces, even though some pawns up, totally uncoordinated. And we have a huge threat right now for black. Yes? Queen h1. Queen h1. And it's kind of tough to defend against that. So white gave a check. Now should we stop that? Yes? G6. G6. We're not going to go rook g6. No way. G6. King f1, and it's black to move and win the game. Yes? Um, and after rook g1? Um, no, there's an even stronger move there. Uh, yes? Yeah. Queen h1? Yes? Um, I think it's queen h2. Yes. And this was kind of a hardworking queen in this game. The queen moving around the whole board and ending on c6, and Karas won his game with the scintillating moving queen. All right, so moving on to our second hero, Botvinnik. Now, Botvinnik, you have to know, is a different type of player. He is methodical and is rarely going for very entertaining or inventive play. He studies at home, comes up with concepts, and tries to play as precisely as possible. So we're going to see a totally different way of playing the Tarash. Knight c5, c5, knight f3, knight c6, e6. The same old, same old, we've seen this. Now the bishop on b5, and the bishop is on c5. Castles, castles, b3. And now, Botvinnik plays a move that is kind of the staple, very important move in this type of positions that we will see in later games as well. Yes? Quick question. Okay. So what is the move? How can black stabilize the pawn on d5? Yes? Bishop e6. And this is such a great move. It's catching on in different variations recently. But Botvinnik showed this already against his match in, against, uh, against Petrosian. <coughs> now, I heard the suggestion of d4, but d4 doesn't work usually because of the idea of knight a4. And we can't defend the d4 pawn and the bishop on c5 simultaneously. And after we move the bishop, it will just get overloaded and we lose the d4 pawn. That is why they don't play d4 in these type of positions so early. So bishop e6, a very good methodical move. Bishop b2, queen e7, knight e2. And always in these middle game positions, we have the first question, where to post our rooks? So how did black continue? Posting his rooks. About the rooks? Yeah, c8. c8. One of them will go there, and it goes there. Yes, rook c8, a3, and rook fd8. Yes, that was your suggestion? Yeah. Correct. So there's actually many ways of posting the rooks. Whenever the rook is on c8 and d8, that usually signals positional play with the idea of trying to make d4 work in the long run. Obviously, I'm not saying d4 will work now with plenty of pieces eyeing the d4 square later. Knight d4, especially, it's not quite possible after knight d4. Bishop g4. Bishop g4 is played now as the d5 pawn is off the hook. There's no pieces attacking it, so the bishop has no reason to stay passive. Remember, we have an isolated pawn. We must play aggressively. Bishop g4, bishop e2. How should we continue here? 
In general, most of our pieces are well placed. The queen is fine. The bishop is super active, hitting on the d4 knight. The knight on c6 is c6 is context. The knight on c6 is contesting the d4 knight. But we have one more piece that is not participating enough. Yes. Yes. So how can we activate the knight on f6? Yes. Knight e4. Jumping in. Also, trained eyes will see that this knight also hints and looks at this f2 square, hoping to get sacrificed there in the long run. Maybe. But we'll see if it happens. Queen d3. And now, black plays a very crafty move. In general, white has a nice grip on the d4 square. But by moving the knight to d4 from c3, black got really active. So if we're really active, that means we can go for the king. And that's what Botvinnik does. He plays bishop d6. He realizes that the d4 is too well protected now. There's no way we can break through. So he moves his pieces into attack mode. He actually has a silent threat in this position. What is black threatening here? It's mostly an exchange operation, but it is, it is pretty strong. In order to find this good idea for black, we have to notice which is the weakest point in white's position. Yes? Bishop takes f3 would um, just get rid of our good bishop. So don't, we don't want to lose that bishop yet. So which is the weakest spot, again, in White's position? Yes? Question. When you say weakest, does it mean the worst? No, when I say the weakest, means the, the pawn that we can reach and actually attack. Yes. The H2 pawn. Yes, the H2 pawn. That's what you wanted to say? Exactly, the H2 pawn. So how can we come closer to that H2 pawn? Yes? Mm -hmm. Queen f6, queen h6. It's a standard idea. Could be a little dangerous because it runs into this bishop. But the other idea is knight e5. So let's say if white plays something like rook d1, we can go knight e5. Takes, queen takes e5, takes, takes, queen takes g2, and Double attack, my friend. Hitting on g4 and on f2. And black has very good play in general. But if he doesn't play, for example, rook d1, let's say he plays b4, then we still have this knight e5 idea, and queen h2 is a direct checkmate. So that's a very good idea to keep in mind. So he played g3 for that same reason, so knight e5 doesn't work it would run into knight takes e5, and now the bishop on g4 is undefended for reals. Because if takes, takes, bishop takes e5, we exchange too many pieces, and that's not good for us when we have an isola isolated pawn. Yeah. So he plays knight c5, queen b1, knight e4, and he comes back because he feels all of my pieces are well positioned. I don't need to do anything. I posted everything in their right position, so this should be fine. Queen d3, knight c5, queen d1. White rejects the repetition of a draw. So knight e6. What's the point of knight c6? e6, I mean, knight e6. Yes? Yes. Yes, it's a very strong move what Botvinnik played. It's actually very rare that black players play knight e6. Usually, black 
moves around with knight e4, and it's a typical position. But knight e6 is very original, trying to undermine the d4 square, as pointed out. Rook e1, bishop c5. Now notice that Botvinnik realized that he's not going to mate when there's a g3 pawn there. So he said, OK, now I'm going to undermine your d4 square then. Knight e6, rook e1, bishop c5, knight takes. So there was way too much pressure at this point on Petrosian's position. So he decides to exchange one pair of piece. b takes c6, b4, bishop b6. Actually, knight e5 is an interesting suggestion in this position. Because after, let's say, takes, takes, why? might hope for a slight advantage because of these weak pawns. But the black pieces are well coordinated, so black shouldn't be that worse. So b4, bishop b6, queen a4. And now black plays this amazing move of queen e8. We'll see why. Rook e a d1. And Black still didn't give up on the idea of breaking through with d4. But for that, he needs to strengthen this battery along this h5 d1 diagonal. And he comes up with a true original idea here. Yes? Um, f5? f5 is close. Actually, Botvinnik played f6. He didn't play f5 because he was a little bit afraid of getting too many pawn weaknesses. But with f6, he actually takes away this e5 square for white's knight and gets ready to swing over to h5. Queen d1, c5. Now, as we talked about it, when you have an isolated pawn, you have to be active. But also, exchanges are good. Because in general, if you only lose this d pawn, you might get some counter chances later on, as we will see in the game. Knight d4, bishop takes c2, knight, queen takes c2, takes, takes, knight g5. So it's important to notice that even in the end game, you can still play actively. You don't have to wait patiently for white to circle around your d pawn. So knight g5, threatening the pretty cute idea of knight f3 triple check, kind of hitting on all of the rooks and the king. King g2, knight e4, rook d1. And now Botvinnik comes up with a very ambitious solution to his problems, which is much in the spirit of the Tarash. Well, we have an active knight on e4. But that lone knight on e4 won't help us. We need some buddies to actually make it work. Yes? Uh, bishop, c7. bishop c7 with the aim of? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So. Knights love to coordinate with rooks. So how can we make it happen so they can coordinate well? Yes? So how about c takes b4? Yes, yeah, c takes b4. And actually, this is a very edgy move by Botvinnik. Because we don't like having isolated pawns. They can get a little weak. So saying that I don't mind. I'll just get a better rook. It's kind of an edgy decision. A takes b4, rook c2. But what Botvinnik claims, and he claims correctly, is this rook and knight tandem will prove that his position is not worse to white, just because of their strength. Bishop d4, although Petrosian will try to circle this d5 pawn and show that, oh, that pawn is more important than active play. Bishop takes d4, rook takes d4, rook b2. What is rook b2 hinting at? It's also a very principled idea by black. Yes? Uh, 
Yes. He wants to make some space for the other guy on C2. And if that happens, <coughs> that will be the last day for white. Because those powerful double rooks on the seventh rank are usually decisive. With a knight on e4, that's just too much. h4, rook c8, rook takes d5, king f3. But by luck, or I don't know what, white manages to hold. Because the only thing that black would need to do is like a knight g5 check that white just, ch white just stopped. So it just gives another check, king g2, knight e4, and it turns out to be a dynamically equal position. Because for example, let's say white would have played h3, just show how it would work, then rook c8 takes rook c2, and then, now we would have knight g5 check. So white had to defend against this knight g5 check, otherwise black would have been winning. It takes, takes, and it's a piece up. But obviously Petrosian, who will be a future world champion, plays h4, takes rook c2, king f3 here, and knight e4. And basically because of the repetition, they agreed to a draw. Just, it deserves a mention that it would be suicidal to move the knight because the rooks would come in with full force and after like king g2 or king h1, these rooks are just too powerful and after like knight d2, rook e2 here, these positions can get very uncomfortable for white, especially because after knight g2 it's mate. So, I've learned a lot from these two games. And in general, Karas and Botvinnik are great, great isolated pawn players. And in fact, I studied many of these ideas from Paul Karas's book, in his book called Paul Karas Teaches. So I felt confident after seeing all these games and played myself an isolated game in my youth. So e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, c3. Now this is a way of getting isolated pawns, is the c3 Sicilian. Knight f6, usually there's two ways of playing, one of them is d5, or knight f6. Uh, Banus, who is actually a GM right now, and part of the best of the best in Hungary, plays knight f6, e5, knight d5, d4, takes, takes, e6, bishop c4, d6. This is a different pawn structure, but soon I'll get, soon we'll get into that isolated pawn structure again. Rook d1, knight b6, and my opponent is kind of planning to play d5, but as we've seen in Karras's game, the first thing you learn is to stop your opponent from doing their own plans. So what did I play in this position? I really don't want him to play d5. Yes? Well, that would lose my bishop pair and I wouldn't want that. Yes? E takes d6. Exactly. And now we are in isolated pawn territory already. Queen takes d6. And in general, I would love to have my bishop on d3, but I can't post it there right now, because knight b4, bishop e4, and this weird move f5. And he plays this, he would have played this move, I guess, because after this, I would lose the bishop pair and also have an isolated pawn, and that's kind of a no-no. I didn't want that. So I played. Bishop b3, knight a5, and I just went, oh no, uh, I'm not giving you that bishop. Knight d5, and in general, I've learned that if your opponent's pieces move away from c6, especially the knight moves away from c6, there's always a jump, 
that could be used in this type of positions. So I play knight c3. First, I contest the knight on d5, because eventually I do want to play d5 and break through, if possible. So knight takes c3, b takes c3, queen c7, and now I use the fact that black's knight is out of place and not on c6. How did I do that? Yes? On queen e5? No. Not queen e5? Because usually, as we talked about it, in these type of positions, I'm trying to mate. I'm not going to exchange queens if possible. Yes? Queen e4. Queen e4. That's a very principled idea. But what I was aiming in this position is to occupy that e5 square with my knight if my opponent's knight is away. That's actually the way to punish your opponent for misplacing their knight. Now, this is actually a pawn sacrifice. And he didn't take on c3. But I saw this very, very nice idea for white, which tactically justifies my play. Notice that my rook is hanging on a1, but I really don't want to lose a tempi with rook b1. Yes? Bishop b2. Bishop b2. Now, the bishop is taboo, because if you do, I'll say thank you and take your queen. So obviously, you have to take and move your queen away. But then, the whole concept will work. And we'll do what we always wish to do in an isolated position, isolated pawn position. Yes? Queen four. No? We always want to break open in the center. How we do that? Yes. D5. D5. Bam! Opening up both bishops. And after E takes, Rook takes D5. I'm hinting ideas on the king side and also winking on the queen side a little bit. If bishop E6, I'll thank you for the participation and I'll take your knight on A5. You can't really do much because my bishops just take away all the squares. He played bishop d6 instead. Now I played queen d3. In general, queen e4, as suggested before, is an idea, but that would just run into f5, with, which would win a tempi for him. And I don't want to give free tempis. That's not the way I play here. Queen d3, f5. G6 would be the other way of playing. F5, rook e1. What's the idea of rook e1? Did you raise your hand? Yeah. yeah? Well, for a while I can't play d5, but as he played f5, I have a, an eternal square on e5, so I bolster it with rook e1. Rook b8, c4. Now, the c4 pawn is taboo because bishop takes c5, rook takes c5, and if knight takes c4, my rook says hello to you again, and I'll take the knight. And if queen takes c4, my rook does the job and takes the knight again. It's kind of a crafty rook. So c4, rook d8, and this rook on d8 is very annoying. So, how can I just say shoot to that rook? Yes. Yes, I went, say shoot, rook e8. And if I chase that rook away once, I'm going to chase it away twice. Go away, go back to f8 where you belong, passively. But obviously, my young opponent at that time didn't want to do as I want. He objected and played knight c6 instead. Now I noticed a pattern in this position. The rook 
and the queen is on one diagonal. So in general, we have a piece that likes to use these factors. So what did I play in this position? Yes. Yes, bishop f4. So I like my position very much as I have a lot of cross pressure on black's position. Now, my opponent was in big trouble, obviously, burning a lot of time, as it's quite tough to move with black. So he took on e5, hoping that I would take with the bishop, and then he could take with the knight. But he didn't expect my next move. Why to play and get a substantial advantage? Yes. Rook takes, Rook takes e5, exactly. And e5, sir. Rook takes e5, yes. Because after knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, my bishops welcome the two guests on b8 and e8, and I just win. So queen d8, rook e3, asking where is this rook going? Well, he had enough of this position, so he sacrificed the pawn. Bishop takes b takes, bishop takes e5. Now, obviously, this position is glorious for me. But it is still an opposite colored bishop position. So what is a potential danger? Yes. Drawing. Yeah, drawing. So if I exchange everything off, I might, might run into trouble. But... The other tidbit about having queens on the board in opposite colored bishops, the one who has the pressure is likely to be much, much better. And we can see that this bishop, after rook b7, is eyeing this juicy little pawn on g7. So I felt there'll be some chances of mating here. D5, creating a passed pawn if possible. C takes, C takes, rook E7. Queen D4, queen B6. I don't want to exchange queens now. Queen B5, rook D1. Just defending everything. Bishop D7, F4. If you can do it, bolster your bishops. Because this bishop will be, again, eternal. Just like the knight previously. On E5, rook C8, queen A3. Again, kind of double attacking on both a7 and e7. Rook e8, queen d6. Rook f8, h3, rook f7, bishop d4, queen a4, rook d2. What can we notice? Where am I posting my pieces mostly? What color? Yes. What color I'm putting my pieces? Dark. Dark. Yes, exactly. So my point is, I want my pieces protected, and also I want to attack you on g7 sooner or later with rook g3. So the game continued with rook e8, bishop e5. I'm not giving you an open file, no way. Bishop b5, rook g3, queen e4, king h2. And the best way to put your king into safety in opposite colored positions is to put your king in a different color to your opponent's bishop. Queen e1, rook b2, a4, just opening it up. Bishop a4, queen takes a6. I'm still a pawn up, so I'm winning by now. Bishop d1, queen c6, rook e7, and white to move and wrap the game up. Yes? Rook takes g7. Yeah, rook takes g7. And I emphasize the fact that after here, I'll mate you on white squares. This was kind of my favorite game in the isolated pawn structure. But I played another one here, too, against another grandmaster, Grandmaster Medved. And surprisingly, it's going to be a c3 Sicilian again, which will obviously lead to this isolated pawn structure. And we can see the return of bishop e3, just like in Botvinnik's game where he played bishop e6, which is actually symmetrical. c takes d4, c takes d4, knight f6, a3. Why did I play a3 instead of knight c3 here? Yeah. Because you have the bishop in, or the knight in, actually. Yeah. So 
Knight c3 might run into bishop b4 ideas, which I didn't want, because he could exchange it off, and exchanges are not that great in the opening stage for white. So a3, bishop e7, knight c3, queen d6. Where should I post my bishop if I'm planning to attack the king? Yes. Yes, because if I'm playing to open up the position with d5, I want my bishop on the a2 g8 diagonal. If I want to mate my opponent, as kind person I am, I have to post it on b3. Castles, castles, b6, queen e2, and this might look familiar from the Petrosian Botvinnik game. That's how we learn from the greats. So bishop b7, now, as I had more aggressive intentions than Botvinnik in that position, I will position my rooks not on c1 on d1, but on rook d1 and e1. Rook d8, rook e1, h6. Now he plays h6 because if he would, for example, play bishop f8, I would jump to the occasion and play bishop g5. Bishop e7 back, which would be kind of a sad move, then we have a move that we talked about and could be pretty strong in this situation. And it's white to move and put a lot of pressure on black's position. Yes. Yes, yes, correct. Knight e4. Yes. Because what white really badly wants is to attack the h7 pawn and put pressure on the king side. So you correctly point out that knight e4 is the most principled move in the position. So after takes, queen takes e4, I hit on that h7 pawn, and after g6, I will just do the caress and play queen h4. Already tying my opponent up, and I have huge pressure in this position. Because for example, if he takes on g5, knight takes g5, my knight and queen just coordinates perfectly. I have a huge attack here. So he didn't want any of that, therefore he played h6. Bishop b1, bishop f8, bishop c1, g6. And if we recall from previous games, from the Petrosian Botvinnik game, we can realize how we can switch plans now for white. Here I played a move that actually indicated more of a positional threat instead of mating ideas. What did I play here? But in general, g6 signals a different plan for white. So therefore I played bishop a2 with what intention? What's my intention after bishop a2? Yeah, I, I might eye the f7 pawn, but there's too many pawns in front of it. Therefore, I want to play d5, right? Yes, d5. So he stops this a la Petrosian and plays knight e7. But as we learned, if the knight moves, our knight jumps into e5. Now, he realizes that his position is getting very suspicious. So he doesn't play bishop g7, he plays bishop d5 instead, but bishop g7 would have ran into this beautiful classical sacrifice if knight takes f7. And now, I'm not just winning, I'm mating. Because you can't even move to e8 because queen takes e7 mate, and after queen f8, queen f7. So playing with the Isolated pawn also has its benefits, not just the downside. So after bishop d5, I realized that I need to decide the fact which piece I should exchange on d5. And I, re and I came to the conclusion that the knight is very useful because it contests the d5 square, but the bishop is useless at this moment. So I took on d5. Knight takes d5, and can we pinpoint the weakest point? Can we pinpoint the weakest 
uh, target in black's position. Weakest target in black's position. Yes. F7. F7. So how can we jump on that juicy target? Yes. Queen F3. Queen F3. That's what I played. And now black is in trouble. Because usually he would have this idea of knight F5, but then I would just jump at him and play g4 and the f7 pawn falls. So f5 has to be played and that's already a good sign. So the other weakness I sensed and detected was the h6 pawn. So I played knight b5, queen b8, queen h3. Sadly for him, he has to play h5, but that doesn't make his position look too appealing. Bishop g5. Just occupying that amazing square if possible. Bishop g7, and now I make a long distance move, pinpointing that this e6 pawn is a little bit weak. Yes. Knight takes g6 it is not really good now because we're sacrificing something when we already have a very good position. We don't need to do that. So I played the long distance move of queen b3, kind of checking out that guy on e6. So rook e8, bishop takes e7, bishop takes e5. That's the sad necessity of the position, because the knight can't take, because then I'll take on e6. And if rook takes, I'll thank you again. You go here, takes. Queen takes, queen d5, and I win because I have too much material. So he takes on e5, rook takes e5, rook takes e7, and just before he could consolidate, I find a very nice tactical idea in this position. Why to move and win? Yes? Yes, rook takes e6. Rook takes e6 is kind of the question, but then queen takes d5. And the sad reality of this position is that this rook on a8 is a constant weakness. Or for example, king f7, rook e1, queen c8 or e8, queen c8, let's say knight d6 check, and we thank him for participating Actually, knight e6 is not good, I'm sorry, because that would run maybe into queen f6. But the easiest way is just to capture. I capture, take everything, and knight c7 wins. So this, so just rook takes e6 in this position wins. Rook takes e6, plays rook d7, rook g6, king h7, rook g5, and I just collect all the pawns possible. Queen f4 takes, king g6, rook h3, rook e8, queen g3. This is just technical part. I'm up plenty of pawns, so I offer exchanges. Takes, rook e2, b4, rook a2. And I can defend against his doubling with rook f3. And after takes, takes g4, king g5 takes, a, king g2 take h4. I just have way too many pawns. And that's how I learned from Keras and Botvinnik how to play the isolated pawn. Thank you.